<laughs> so we'll, we should start and then she'll. Let's yeah. see. Let's see. Is she there? Okay. Um, yeah, she's in as an attendee. Okay, so we've started the web, um, the meeting. Kyle started, so we're ready to go, and oh, I'll move Maureen oh. over. Oh, good, you did already. All right. Okay, so welcome to the April 13th Board of Health um, meeting. Oh, forgot. I don't have the, the, the script here. Oh, my God, how can I do that? How did I do that? I don't I have understand. the script. Do you have the script? I have I have one. Let me find it. Can you just huh? I I got everything ready today and I totally forgot. I get that. Let the me script. see if I can. There's so many folders here. Yep. Um shoot. I thought I had it. Uh, under Charles. Uh, Ah, oh, here it is, pursuant Yay. to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order. And, you know, we haven't looked it up, but um, Governor Healy has extended this, um, uh, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law under general laws 30A, Section 20, this meeting of the Amherst Board of Health will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. For information on remote participation, please see the agenda on the Board of Health website. There is no in-person attendance of members of the, uh, there's no in-person attendance. Members of the public will be permitted um, to attend and every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so, we will post on the town's website an, a recording of the meeting and approved meeting minutes will be posted on the Amherst Board of Health website as soon as possible after the meeting. I'm sorry, all set but not. So I'm going to do attendees. Tim? Here. Maureen? Here. Okay. And Nancy here. Lauren and Premila are unable to join us tonight. So the first item on the agenda is to review the minutes from the March 9th meeting. <clears throat> And I looked over them. I didn't see any changes. Anybody else? See any I didn't changes? either, but I don't think we have enough because uh, Tim wasn't at the last meeting. That's right. So we have to just bump it to the May meeting because, yes, Tim was not here. So we don't have enough people to vote on this. Or we'll postpone it till the May meeting. And we have public comment on agenda topics only. I don't know if um, anyone. So we do have someone in the, um, an attendee um, who might be speaking up about the, um, uh, the body art establishment. Do you wanna raise your hand if there's anyone that wants to speak now? Okay. Kyle, can you okay. let them in? Yep, and it's Stephen, Stephen Lambert. Okay, Stephen, you're unmuted. Would you like to speak? During our public um, comment session, we listen and we do not respond um, to you at that time, at this time, but we're very open to listening. Okay, awesome. So I wrote something up. Uh, bear with me as I've never really done any sort of public speaking. So, that's okay. Uh, all right. So, hello, my name is Stephen Lambert. I'm the owner of Wanderlust Tattoo. Since 2015, I've been operating in downtown and would like y'all to know that I've been tattooing for <laughs> nine years in total. Wanderlust Tattoo has served the community for the past eight years, providing our services to students, locals, and patrons from other states as well. 
Our clients not only get work done here, but also contribute to our local economy through downtown parking, going to local eateries, hotels, music venues, and shopping at local stores while they're in town. Over the years, we've grown. In the past, we've hired people that we knew or had worked with previously, or even trained artists ourselves. Now, as we're all aware, the demand for tattooing has grown exponentially. And we're looking to bring on new artists. Artists may come from other towns, states, or even other countries. The best and safest way to bring them through the interview process is to invite them here as temporary guest artists. These artists would pay the town a reduced fee and work with us for periods of time ranging from a week to several months to make sure that they're the right fit. It is my duty not only as the owner of my business, but a business owner here in Amherst to do my due diligence to ensure the safety procedures that we are required to follow are being conducted, that they're professional and willing to participate in a team oriented environment and ultimately willing to contribute as an upstanding individual in this community. While I have your ear, I'd also like to propose another change to the regulations. Many people who have applied do not have a GED or high school diploma, but have been wildly talented and licensed artists for years. The regulation has barred several incredible artists from working with us in the past. Amherst is a town known for its education and many people know that people learn in a multitude of ways. Our trade is an old one passed down from master to apprentice for the past 2000 years. Though our industry is changing, there is no recognized college or institution to learn tattooing. Other than the master, <laughs> other than the master and apprentice relationship. That being said, the majority of towns and states do not require a formal education to become a valued member of the tattoo community. I'd like to grow and contribute to this town for many more decades and contribute to the revenue therein. So I urge you to consider my professional suggestions. I appreciate your time and thank you for your opportunity to open this dialogue. I'm happy to hear any questions or feedback that you have. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Steve. And as we get into our <clears throat> um, old business, our, the regulations are coming up at that at that time. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Great. Um, anybody else would like to make a public comment at this time? Uh, okay, Dick Evans. Um, can we let Dick in? Dick, can you hear us? Oh, he disappeared. I still see him. Oh, uh, it disappeared from my screen. Okay. So Dick, you're muted. Hello, could you hear me? Yes, no, yeah, now we can. Sorry, I'm here to speak about the tobacco license at uh, Six University Drive. I don't know if this is the appropriate time or you want to wait, want me to wait until you get to that point on the agenda. Um, I think it's best uh, to wait until uh, sure. we discuss that. Um, sure. Okay. Sure, thank you. Okay, no other comments. So we'll move to old business. And first on the agenda is toxic chemicals. Um, we have Jeremiah LaPlante and Tim has also contacted Tori who will come to a, a, a later meeting. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tim and Jeremiah. Jeremiah, have you looked at our regulations? Yes, yes, I have. Um... Okay. Uh, Did you hear? Jennifer has shared them with me. And okay. Sort of I went them. back into the history of it. And, and are you aware of the history of it that it came to being in 2000? I don't have those notes there. 2001, where a um, member of the community went to the select board to ask about what chemicals are being bought by the town to have it as a bylaw and it was moved to the health department. And this was put in as a regulation back then under mainly what was purchased. Um, and we are the only town in the Commonwealth that has 
such a regulation. So we're looking at all our regulations and trying to figure out how to revise, update them, or what we'll be doing with them. And Tim has been taking the lead on that. Yeah, so I, I, I will say I will say that you know I that it is interesting to hear that that we are uh, unique and 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 by having uh, those regulations in place, uh, but at the same time I would say that I, I think that uh, there has been much more awareness in in the the chemicals that that uh, municipalities or or the state has has been using. Um, if we were to look at um, the MassGov website, they do offer a lot of information uh, regarding uh, those different types of environmentally preferred uh, products, and they have a, a fairly comprehensive list of, of uh, uh, products that, that I, I suppose you could say that they would prefer um, we, we use. Uh, so, so as far as a, a, a sort of a standard of practice for the town, we try to do our best to abide by those uh, regulations that, that the state has uh, essentially put in s stating that, you know, it, it, they would prefer that we use uh, chemicals that are uh, more uh, environmentally friendly. Um, so when <laughs> I'm doing my purchasing, I, I like to be sure that it does have that green label on that. So uh, say, uh, you know, I'm using some type of uh, company I, w without naming any, uh, you know, where, wherever I get my uh, clean, cleaning chemicals, I look at the, the product list and, and the data sheets to ensure that it does have that, that green seal on it. So it looks like just like a little uh, leaf uh, so th that is that's my practice, and and uh, to to make it easier across uh, the the buildings, I try to have the same products, so same dispensing equipment, uh, and that that ensures um, we we are uh, we do have that sort of standard um, uh, procedures, and it also helps with the. Uh, being familiar with those products. So if, I, if we do have individuals that shift between buildings, they know that they're going to see the same types of products in each one of those facilities. Uh, I think when looking at some of the more recent uh, items that are, that are on the, the document, uh, where I, I feel that we may find some challenges is when we start getting into PFAS chemicals. Uh, it's, it's, I, I haven't necessarily seen anything that makes it easy to identify whether or not uh, a, a particular product has any PFAS chemicals in it. Uh, instead, you're opening up um, uh, like the the data sheets um, and and actually looking at the chemical composition of the products, so I think th I think that one might be a little bit of a hurdle. I don't I don't think that it's 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 an unachievable item, um, but that one may may um, ca cause more discussion. Or I would say it, it would it would bring on more discussion. Thank you. Tim, do you have questions? Yes. Uh, so the toxic chemicals bylaws is not new or the, we are the only one. I have seen toxic uh, chemical bylaws for towns which are trying to protect aquifers, um, water supplies, and I think they have uh, exclusive toxic chemical um, loss on restrictions and mitigation when they are sitting on a aquifer which supplies the water supplies you know so i think they are there um so some of the templates was um, uh, on certain infiltrates and everything was primarily um, uh, we use similar type of language uh, when we are developing ours you know um so um thank you jeremy i think it's a uh, 
good overview of you know how proactive you are you know in terms of uh, getting the best in the market which can have a minimal environmental impact um, so this uh, bylaw was uh, as as nancy was mentioning uh, we had a very uh, focused bylaw in terms of uh, uh, asset free papers and that type of very basic procurements <clears throat> um, but as uh, it, it is not only focused on procurements, we are thinking um, Board of Health should have some sort of a policy on um, any type of a toxic chemicals potentially coming up because we are seeing emerging use of them, you know, either out on the grounds, um, uh, fire control. Um, so many of them, even for uh, what, uh, water resistant fabrics or uh, that type of things is has some sort of a uh, heavy use of PFAS you know uh, so um, it is just a I think you know that it is not uh, a regulation which essentially saying you cannot use it or anything it was some sort of a guidance on saying um, uh, minimize those types of impact rather than saying no you cannot use particular chemicals you know it's not like a yes or no question um, um, this type of a policy uh, might help in the future um, when we have someone who's coming um, after Jeremiah Jeremiah is very pro-green but in the future we, we might have some sort of a they might ask for some sort of a what what type of things uh, what do what guidance we have it might be helpful for having that type of standard. So, um, so it is just providing some sort of a general uh, baselines on <laughs> what we should do in terms of procurement. So it looks like you are doing perfectly fine in terms of identifying the best in the market. So I don't know uh, if I'm clear on our purpose of developing the bylaw. No, you had mentioned to me on an email that you were in communication with Tori, the Toxic Use Reduction Institute right. at UMass Lowell. Are they going to be coming to our May meeting? No, uh, no, I'm sorry if I communicated uh, okay. incorrectly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to meet with them very shortly before our May meeting. Okay. But I can invite them for our May meeting to see if they're one of them, one or two of them are available. So these are uh, Turi Institute's director. Mm -hmm. And he suggested that I also include uh, OTA, which is the Office of Technical Assistant in the state government. Uh, they usually handle some of, maybe they are the ones who are putting up that list you see in the mass.gov. Uh, so, we are trying to find a common time uh, to meet and just to uh, brainstorm how we could. Uh, they're very excited to see, you know, so the town is proactively putting something together for a pilot. So uh, based on that meeting, um, I will invite them for our next meeting. Okay. Uh, but if Jeremy wants to join us, you're welcome to, yeah. Jeremy. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, but that is the status of it. You know, I'll be glad to invite them. Or, you know but in uh, I plan to find a plan to find something uh, in the coming week to meet with them to so just to compare notes and what their suggestions are and uh, based on that I also can invite them yes um, well use your judgment whether may is the right meeting to invite them to or a later meeting <clears throat> I mean with We've been working on this for almost two years and um, we need to get it right. And um, as we read and meet, there's more and more coming out about um, chemicals, especially PFAS. Mm -hmm. So we wanna make sure that we get this regulation right. Um, so use your judgment, Tim, if they can come to the May meeting, whatever suggestions they have that that we can write a good regulation for, um, that would be 
very helpful. And thank you for all the work you've been doing. Yes, I will do that. Um, I don't know if you heard on the news that EPA has some regulations put out for PFAS and you know uh, and PFOS um, mm -hmm. for drinking water supplies, and so we might see more in the future. But it's also, as uh, Jeremy was saying, it's also a very complex uh, yeah. issue. Mm -hmm. uh, it is forever chemicals which mm -hmm. are everywhere. Um, I have seen. Um, some of them uh, uptaken by plants to soils and uh, uh, in, 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 you know, in a different locations you know, in terms of our commodities we are using day to day. So it's always a challenge on how to handle that. <laughs> I attended the Region 1 EPA, I mean, uh, EPA meeting on PFAS Tuesday night. Um, and, and the, the, it was an overview of, of the regulations, how they're coming. And people who spoke were talking about specific um, PFAS contaminated areas. But the, the point of the um, webinar was to, to look upstream to prevent any PFAS from getting into the environment as much as possible. Um, so yeah, it's... Every time you turn around, you hear about it. So. Yeah, when we were looking at the turf field, I got into a number of articles about PFAS and, and into the weeds a little bit. And one of the sources of PFAS and some like products are actually the container that they're uh, sold in. So your cleaning material itself would not have anything added to it. But once it's in this container, it can pick it up. And, and so I, I think it's a just, you know, with the number of different chemicals and, and uh, the tiny amounts that can make a difference, it's an, it's an unbelievably complicated uh, issue going forward, but yeah, we can yeah, do the best we can. <laughs> yesterday I was cooking and we have a, a relatively new nonstick griddle. And I said to my husband, I said, um, I wonder if there's PFAS in this. How do you even know? And I'm cooking on it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think the conversation will eventually become not necessarily lo looking at each and every one of the chemicals that or products that we're using, but just one of the easier ways might just be um, chemical reduction. So if there if there's any way that we can uh, when say say for me when I'm perhaps I'm replacing flooring I I'm choosing a floor that doesn't need to be waxed and buffed and stripped and mm -hmm. so there's not all these different chemicals that are used fairly regularly on it where we can just clean with something that is more. And environmentally friendly uh, and and has a much uh, less impact. So those that's those are also things that I try to think about. It's it's if I can at, at, at all possible, let's mm -hmm. I try to reduce use products that's not going to keep making it so we're we're using more and more stuff on them. That's great. You know, um, Jeremiah, I'll talk to you in another time, but I think about. Um, people that bring in their personal cleaning products, like I see them in the kitchens, mm -hmm. like underneath. I think that needs to be restricted so we can I know. have on that. But that's another conversation. Well, it's it's appropriate, but we can talk about it. Yeah, I, it's it's something. I it's that's an uphill battle. It's, it's oh, a... <laughs> oh, you you addressed this. <laughs> I look. I I watch. I watch. I try. Yeah. I, you that's know, if great. anybody, I, you don't need to bring it in. I'm I'm happy to get something for you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Jeremiah, do you have a, a link or, or do you work with the Toxic Use Reduction Institute at UMass Lowell? I, I don't, but I'm definitely interested and in, in want to look into that further. So yeah. I, I will have, have a look at that. Okay. They have some nice resources on their website. Yeah. Um, uh, they also have a bit, very large team, you know, if you want to actually consult on something. And I think they have an outreach team, okay. but the uh, the PFAS uh, is some sort of a 
in my opinion, I think we started the dialogue and talking about it, that itself is a good thing. Um, but uh, once the EPA start to, I think EPA has some six PFAS you know, uh, uh, standards developed for drinking water. They might also develop some standards for soils and air quality, and, and then it will start to trickle down in terms of the products which are being used. Mm -hmm. And also probably treatment. So adding some tre uh, treatment to it because most of the treatment doesn't have have this one removed, you know. So maybe those additional aspects of filters might be added or to remove the PFAS. So there might be more coming up, uh, uh, you know. But I, I, I'm thinking recognizing this as a important one and uh, having that showcase some sort of a roadmap of okay, we are recognizing the Board of Health is recognizing this, but we also want to be some sort of a, a, a example uh, in terms of leading leading this way you know so that's how that's how I I look at this by line you know, so. and using the precautionary principle precautionary yeah does anyone else have any comments I see Maria has her hand up Maureen Jeremiah okay. shall we open it up for Maria I think do we typically wait to the, end? To the end? Yeah, we'll wait till the end. Um, okay. So how it stands is <clears throat> um, Jeremiah is doing his piece to use the green chemicals in town. Tim is going to be communicating with Tori and whether Tori comes to our May meeting or a future meeting, that's to be determined as we work on this regulation. We have that. Is that correct, Tim? Yeah, and also OTA, Office of Technology Assessment in the state. Oh, that's right, OTA. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you again for all your work. Okay, next is Body Arts Establishment Regulation. Thank you, Maureen. Jeremiah. Oops. Thank, thank you Thank all. you, Jeremiah. So I, I don't know what, if you had a chance to look at um, the mishmash I sent out I to you. Did. I did. But it did. is like a combination of uh, the original regulations from the town of Amherst with some thoughts and other additions, mostly from Northampton, but also a few other places. And I think um, there were a lot of details in different places in terms of getting photo IDs and things like that, which I think are just easy to do and make sense. Mm -hmm. But they're also like, I think, and I think that, that Nancy outlined some of these earlier or things for us to actually look at. And I think the first one that comes up is um, the restrictions. And exclusions and restrictions, um, like cosmetic tattooing is is excluded in Amherst. I think that is something that is, I think there's one place in Northampton that does it, that may be more, that, but I didn't see any ad, other ads for that. And it requires a slightly different training. Um, and the other thing is Amherst says, here are the things you can do with um, piercing in particular, whereas other places say, here are the things you can't do. Yes. Honestly, I kind of like here are the things you can do because I can't even think of all the things you might, somebody might be asking to be pierced and, you know, and to put them in as you can't do this. But um, most other places do have a, have a more um, of a, a list of things that are not allowed. Um, so that's an, one area. And then I guess the other big areas are the addition of um, the guest artist uh, program. And that's pretty straightforward. It would probably be a matter of our deciding the length of uh, stay for such guest artists um, and whether we codify the um, things that sounds like they're already happening is the apprentice apprenticeship and 
in town. Um, you know, I think that it's fine. And I agree with, um, was it Stephen? Stephen, right? And, you know, that, that the most places don't require a high school diploma. Now, um, you know, because it is, it is an art. Um, I guess there's a lot of technical things that being, uh, you know, able to read well and understand practices is a good thing. But it, I think it's also, like he said, different ways of learning about the practices and procedures and protocols, <laughs> you know, seem reasonable. Yeah. Um, so that's and Premla hasn't been able to really participate in this in this past month. She's had hasn't really been as available as she would have liked to be. Okay. I did um, look at them. And other than I can see where you copy and pasted. And so we, you have Northampton and you have Boston. So that has to be wordsmithed out. Right. Obviously. Yes. yes. I, I, I didn't do that. But, and I didn't try to get the, all the numbers and, and letters um, and line up because I, I so thought my, let's decide what we want to do and then make a document that does it um, and bring it around again for a close. So, um, uh, there were two questions I had under um, it's not it's not numbered, but application for practitioner license shall be included and has declaration about any prior criminal records. Is that does that mean doing a Corey check or does that mean well, what they you say? know what? I think that should be probably what it is. It's like um because I thought maybe that Amherst safety and I don't know that other thing might be be something to do with getting a Corey check. I I, I mean, uh, for my license, I need to agree to a Corey check every two years, you know, so right. I think this is an, another area which that wouldn't be unreasonable um, to, to have a Corey check. Um, in Provincetown, and I don't know the law or the practice around this also checks yearly to see if any of to, on the um, uh, sexual predator lists, you know, to make you, I guess, it, it, I don't know if you have to agree to having, you know, that investigated or not, but they do do that. I would think that that would come up on a Corey check. I just don't know enough about what's included in the, in the Corey, but I think, um, I think that is one thing that seems like it's not wasn't evident and and, and maybe should be <laughs> yeah so that was one question i had the other um and, and when i look at this and what steven brought up we don't have that you need to show your high school diploma or ged any place in this from what i can see it says it's required but it yeah. doesn't Where is um it? yeah it i saw say it. that i don't remember <laughs> this application I think um, it was there. Yeah, application there. for practitioner. It says name, date of birth, residence address, mailing address, phone number. I think what, it might be the training and of section training, E. Training E. Um, I see in section nine. Uh, there's so much stuff here. I know. And, and uh, section nine uh, under B, it says something uh, and have a high school diploma or equivalent. Section nine, uh, section eight, section nine, number B. B. Application. And I'm in the following. No, I don't see it there. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't there know. Are it depends on which nine, nine you're looking at. <laughs> there are second <laughs> nine. <laughs> the second nine. The second oh, yeah. nine application for tattoo practitioner. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 18 years old and have a high school diploma or equivalent. Ah. Uh, yeah, and it says omitted in Northampton. So 
I would agree with taking that out. Yeah. And then the other thing is that I had um, put a whatever. Oh man. Uh, oh, 14 days. So this is under train uh, guest artists. And and Stephen said, I, I thought 14 day period was a sort of short mm -hmm. um, or a temporary item. And then he said, but it's uh, it, to four temporary permits per calendar year. Is that per person or per establishment? I would think it was per Per, per per person per artist like but that's okay. how I read it but I don't know so I think we you know we can and I remember earlier on when I was looking at it some of them had 30 days um, mm -hmm. you know I I would be very happy having it 30 days with and a, also with maybe um with a renewal possible with renewal yeah just two weeks seems like mm. yeah no that seems reasonable other than that those are the only two other than all the words missing those were the only two questions okay i had um thank you i know i <laughs> had so much you know like i said i didn't take the time to kind of make everything line up because right. I thought, well if we didn't include this then i have mm -hmm. to redo it and so i i'll maybe yeah, and now yes. and the next time i will make it to a document that looks presentable um present next time put page numbers on it too so if we can say page because there's no page right there are no numbers. page numbers um <laughs> Yeah, it, it doesn't actually flow very well right now in, in some of the sections. I, I think you mentioned this too. When I downloaded the Northampton one, the formatting was horrible. Mm -hmm. um, and and then I, I kind of went over to, to Melrose and Worcester. I was using them a little more when I yeah. was looking at them. Um, I'm trying to think if there are other other. Oh, the other thing, you know, I think uh Jennifer communicated to me this, that Stephen had told her that nobody uses reusable needles or sharps or anything anymore so nobody has an autoclave mm -hmm. and um so everything is a single use disposable yeah. so I guess we should continue to keep that in but and Northampton actually had a statement that we didn't have that said if there's no reusable items or if everything is single use you don't need to have an autoclave we could put um, that in also the other thing i like is that you have to have a bona fide sharp container mm. because at a very early flu clinic when betty anderson frederick was director we were using old detergent bottles uh -huh. to put needles in and the only time i got a needle stick in my life was through one of those. So I'm glad you had a bona fide sharps container so a needle would not go through it. Yeah. Um because back then and also they were they were putting needles into styrofoam at flu clinics way back then. Oh well, that I've never seen. Um bleach bottles I have seen. <laughs> um yeah, there's so much to do with cleaning and and you know i guess we can just let that ride um but but with the notion that mostly it's going to be single use items at this point um i should have asked jeremiah while he was here there was something like something about uh the sanitizing liquids that you're using to know that they're up to strength and how and how to manage that and i mean i guess i always thought it was just if they had expired or if you mix them you date it and you throw it out at a certain time but i don't know what that meant <laughs> somewhere in there but i'll i'll, I'll go through it again and 
we can then maybe go through it line by line at some point. Okay. And I think Premal is happy <coughs> once she thinks settled for her. Okay. So we want to make it as user friendly and as supportive of our tattoo artists as possible, keeping with all health standards and yeah. safety standards. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Another. Uh, can I quickly ask a sure. uh, question? Um, I haven't read this, but I I'm just wondering if you have included some language on risk management. For example, if something happens, you know, what is the plan they have? Should they have a plan? Yes. Managing bleeding and all whatever it is. Uh, the second thing, like I think I saw something about CPR certification, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So those are something good, you know. Yeah, I think there there is training in in <laughs> in first aid and CPR, but also um bloodborne pathogens and um they have to have an um, emergency plan and a and a kind of a plan for like needle stick injuries yeah, um, and isn't there something with reporting if i remember and it has to be that? reported to the yes. board of health mm -hmm. um and there yeah there are a lot of steps that that they would take um and that, that other document that we got about signing off on different, we can talk about that too. That was new to me, that, that form that was say, I, you know, I will follow these rules and, and initial that. I don't know if that's something that we need. One of the things that it says in Northampton is, is that this becomes like a policy and procedure manual for the establishment and each practitioner needs to have have that a copy of it and to have read it looked at it so so they know what the rules are it um, could be like a tobacco quiz we had <laughs> oh no <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well I, I don't know if i'd know the answers <laughs> um yeah so the, yeah the, you know i i was surprised that this isn't something regulated at the state level because it is I don't know. It seems more like in the barbering uh, cosmetology. I don't know. It's you know, it's an art that requires sharp instruments. You know, I. Um, but so in the fact that each town has different regulations is makes it confusing. I think that's because uh, tattooing is relatively new in Massachusetts. Yeah, I guess it wasn't allowed or something. Before. Right. No. no, no. No, because my he son was there. 20, so say 20 years ago, he had to go to Connecticut to get his tattoo, his first tattoo. I have to say, um, yeah. Um, that, that I felt, my experience with people in town had seemed like they were pretty responsible. I was just going to say that my daughter wanted a, a pierced eyebrow or something when she was 16 or 15, and and I think that the um, piercer said, no, you should wait. <laughs> and, you know, so my husband didn't have to be, you know, my husband was ready to do it, but they just decided it was worth waiting. Um, so that was, I thought that was pretty responsible now that I look back at it. Okay. Any other comments? Thank you, Maureen. I You're welcome. We'll keep at it. Yes. <laughs> okay. So community assessment update. Um, the students are working very hard. They're getting a lot of very good data. And some data is not available, but that tells a story too. So they're they're putting that in. As a matter of fact, they had given me some information and I shared it with the um, Amherst um, Affordable Housing Trust. Um, and they're moving from, instead of having a listening session, they're having a public forum. So the students will be presenting their, their community assessment data on June 8th too. 
to us. And um, this side piece that I mentioned at our last meeting is through the community assessment, I got involved with the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust, which is they were going to have a listening session on housing, which is a social determinant of health. And they are having this um, meeting on June 20th that I will attend um, as a public forum. Then on July 18th, they are going to have a housing resource fair and they would like someone from the health department and or a sanitarian there. It's gonna be at July 18th from 6.30 to 8.30 at the Bang Center. So that's a sort of a side piece related to the community assessment. Um, I, I just was at that meeting yesterday morning. So I, will that work out? Jen, for the health department and or a sanitary, uh, one of our inspectors related to housing. He can ask. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and that's July 18th, 630 to 830 at Bangs. Um, that's all I have on the community assessment. If anyone has any questions for me. I, I just have to say the students are doing amazing work. Um, they're really doing great. And will this, they wrap up at the end of this sem semester and into the summer and that'll be completed? Is that the, yes, well, they'll be presenting it on, on June 8th, but mm -hmm. Kyle and another one of the students who are in their, their, four year of their four plus one will still be available so that if there's other areas that need to be continued with, we can work on a, a plan for them to continue it okay. uh, for the next, uh, next year. <laughs> and I've mentioned it to both of them um, and they're aware of that. Okay, new business. The tobacco license at Six University Drive. Jen, do you want to? <clears throat> yep. So, um, Kyle, if you could let in three people, no, uh, two people. So, Akshar Patel and Dick Evans. And we have Steve McCarthy from permitting here. And I'm going to ask um, Steve if you want to uh, summarize what's going on. Um, Akshar and uh, Dick Evans um, came to me to talk about a tobacco license. And my interpretation was that the license that was previously held by University Liquors at Six University had not been renewed in time and therefore would be sunsetted and not transferred. But there's so many little subtleties. I just really am happy that um, that it's being brought forth to the board so they can hear and make a decision. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand it over to, um, to, to Dick Evans. You're muted. muted. Yeah. There, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, thanks so much. My name is Dick Evans. I'm a lawyer <laughs> in Northampton. And I'm very pleased to represent uh, Oscar Patel, who's on your screen there. Oscar is one of, is Oscar, everybody calls him Oscar. Oscar is one of two partners in Nilcanth Associates, LLP, a, an entity which has operated uh, a beer and wine store in Belchertown for over 18 years. And uh, they recently acquired, or in the process of acquiring a license to operate a package store at uh, Six University Drive, the site of the former university liquors. Not much is gonna change there. Even the signage will remain pretty much the same. Uh, <clears throat> obviously the previous operator of that site did uh, sell tobacco. And uh, we're trying, we're here today to seek some guidance from the board with regard to uh, uh, Nilkant's uh, right or their opportunity to, uh, uh, obtain a license or otherwise to, to sell tobacco from the uh, 
the uh, package store. Um, let me say first that I've looked at the regs very closely. I'm talking about the regs that were adopted a couple of years ago in 2020. In fact, some of you were authors of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and to be honest, I, I, I can't see where the regs require a tobacco license for package stores. The, they do require them for um, uh, non-age restricted retail establishments like general stores. <laughs> and they are required for adult only tobacco retail stores. But there's nothing in the regulation that requires uh, licenses or permits for adult only alcohol stores. Am I, am I misreading the, the regulations? Uh, I mean, I'm looking at paragraph Roman numeral five on paragraph five, which says the town of Amherst permits tobacco sales in two categories of retail establishments, namely the non-age restricted retail establishments and the adult only tobacco stores, but it's silent as to adult only alcohol stores or adult only any other kind of stores for that matter. But I don't think Amherst has any adult only bookstores. Um, but so that's, I, I, as I read this, the regulations, they don't govern sales of tobacco from package stores. And I'm asking you if I'm reading this wrong, uh, let me know, please. Um, but let me add, I'm not, Oscar's not trying to shirk his responsibilities. He wants to be a responsible vendor of tobacco products. Uh, he recognizes um, the, the hazards of tobacco. He's, his views about tobacco are very consistent with all of yours, I'm sure. But on the other hand, he is a businessman and he wants to maximize his profits in that area. Uh, he, is, he anticipates observing fully, whether he has a permit from this board or not, he fully anticipates and, is, and in fact is pledged to, to observe the spirit of the regulations He's not going to be doing any advertising. He's not going to put posters in the windows concerning uh, tobacco. He's not going to sell any electronic uh, smoking devices. He's going to use the ID science authentication method for uh, authenticating IDs. Uh, he's not going to sell any flavored tobacco um, as the regulations uh, require for licensed sites. Uh, there won't be any prominent display of tobacco products in the store, it'll, uh, it'll be kept under the counter. Um, he's not going to have any promotional sale, like sales or price reductions on uh, tobacco products. And he'll post the notice that's required by uh, uh, General Laws 270 Section 7 uh, and required by the regulations. So I, what I'm asking, what we're asking the board is for some clarification as to whether Packet stores are even governed by the regulations in the first place. Um, and, uh, or ask you to decide, uh, to take no action rather on, on this decision, uh, whether or not he needs a permit uh, until you've revised the regulations. I was glad to hear some discussion a few minutes ago about revisiting and revising your regulations. That may be something you might wanna revisit. Uh, and then I'd also, ask you to take into account as we opened with the fact that not much is changing there except ownership of that site. And, uh, and, and Oscar, we very much appreciate the opportunity to assume the, uh, the tobacco license that was held by the previous operator uh, or, or get a new one and, uh, and certainly subject himself to all the, the regulations. Uh, so that's what I've got to say. So I'm here to seek some guidance from the board and I, I hope you have some for us. Um, let's see. I guess Maureen and I, uh, Maureen, Tim, and I were on. Yeah. If I look where I, I recall that liquor stores were included, whether the wording is not clear, it but in the definition of the non-age restricted retail establishment, it goes on to say, um, tobacco, but does not restrict entry to uh, uh, people under age 21. These include, but are not limited <laughs> to convenience stores, gas stations, liquor stores, bodegas, supermarkets, and other similar businesses. So maybe I are, you know, excuse my ignorance, but are liquor stores um, age restricted? Oh, absolutely. 
You can't uh, ours is your, for sure. This is a twenty one only. Can't go in the store. I. I <laughs> yeah, we are an adult only alcohol retail establishment. So I think that was an oversight, I think, on our part. Tim, to not define that have, specifically. Do you have a comment? I, I think um, um, that is a one specific case. Uh, it's again a retail outlet. Um, I don't know if that is a critical element uh, in terms of not having a license. So I'm I'm seeing it's it's still a retail, you know, uh, age restricted retail, you know, whether it's a package store or any any other type of retail. In this revision and the earlier revision, and we work with the state on this, um, and Cheryl Sabara and T.J. Wilson. The point is, when a license goes, it's gone. And we want to decrease the number of places that sell tobacco products in town. And that's clear in section five, number 10. And if you look at A, B, and C. Yes. Are you, are you saying that, that, that the regulations do govern packet store sales? It, the, the regulations any place that sells tobacco products. That's what the regulations cover. We worked with two lawyers on this. Cheryl Sabara and TJ Wilson from the state. And the point in this revision and in the revision five years before that was we want to decrease the number of sites that sell tobacco. When a license is gone, it is gone. And it's under um, section five, number 10. Uh, any, uh, permit, uh, when any permit not renewed because a retailer no longer sells tobacco products or because a retailer closes the retail business, it shall be returned to the Amherst Board of Health and shall be permanently retired by the Board of Health. A total of num allowable number of tobacco sales permits under Section A above shall be reduced by the number of retired permits. Earlier it says no existing renewal shall be, will be denied on the, on based on the requirements of this um, subjects, subsection, except any permit holder who has failed to renew his or her permit within 30 days of expiration will need to come before the board. So the former owner. It also says applicants who purchase or acquire an existing business, they bought the business, but it did no longer hold a valid tobacco license permit at the time of sale of acquisition. When did he buy this business? He didn't. They let the license go. It's gone. Are, are you saying that, that, that the Amherst regulations do govern sales of tobacco from adult only alcohol? It, it, anywhere. Anywhere. Any place that sells tobacco is <laughs> governed by this regulation. The question is, where can tobacco be sold? Is tobacco prohibited from sale from adult-only alcohol stores? Can you point to the regulation where, where it says they are prohibited? You'll notice that in Section 5, it says the town of Amherst permits tobacco sales in two categories of retail establishment. It doesn't say only re two categories of retail establishments, does it? I mean, I don't see the only there. I'm just going by what the regulations say about the licenses. We hold, we give the permission for the licenses. And I just lost it here. Um, and if you go to section five, number 10, 
Yes, yeah, so I'm familiar with that section. Okay. You just read it, yeah. The question is, do the Amherst regulations govern the sale of tobacco from adult-only alcohol stores? It doesn't, yes. they don't adhere to. It, they, re, they, every place that sells tobacco needs a license. Well, does you're saying that the town of Amherst does in fact govern uh, tobacco sales from adult only alcohol stores, yes. notwithstanding the license, the language to the contrary in the regulations? Yes. Jen, do you have a list of where the licenses are? I don't have that in front of me, but every do, place do. sells license. Steve, do you, wanna, do you wanna talk, Steve? Yeah, if um, if I may, and thank you for the board for having me. Um, so I am uh, Steve McCarthy. I'm the licensing coordinator for Inspection Services, and um, you know I'm the one who uh, initiated this conversation with Jen, um, and we ultimately came to the point where um, we thought it would be worth um, addressing the board. But um, so my job is to you know I primarily deal with liquor licenses, rental property regulation. Um, other types of business licenses. And one of the things that's landed in my uh, portfolio there is tobacco licenses. Um, so I um, have an interesting perspective of uh, interpreting these regulations, um, but I wasn't um, you know, involved in the process of drafting them. Um, and um, there was a, there's sometimes where um, situations occur which may not fall um, strictly within the provisions of the regulations. Um, and this is one of them. Um, and so I was a bit um, confused as to how to proceed. So a little bit of background. The previous licensee, uh, University Liquors, um, was in business there for several years, well, many years, I believe. And um, ultimately, um, late last year, um, they closed up um, for whatever reason. Not sure exactly what happened, but they lost access to the site. Um, and um, we did not review, renew um, their, their liquor license was not eligible for renewal. Um, for reasons that are specific to liquor licenses, um, you know, in those regulations. And so um, we did have a, uh, a, an open application process to, uh, to get the new liquor license. And um, uh, so Oscar and his father um, were the, was the team that won the application along with Dick representing them. Um, and the uh, license commission was um, impressed with their business plan. Um, and after the liquor license was granted, um, they inquired about tobacco um, and, um, now, normally, you know, let's say that they were just open, opening up a completely new liquor store, you know, somewhere in South Amherst, um, you know, as you said, the Board of Health has a policy to retire tobacco licenses. Um, and so I would have just told them, you know, it's not possible out of hand. Um, but I do think that there's a place where the regulations are a bit um, ambiguous on this note. Um, so if you refer to um, Section 53C6, it says a tobacco product sales term is non-transferable. Um, a, new a new owner of an establishment that sells tobacco products as defined herein must apply for a new permit. No new permit will be issued unless and until all outstanding penalties incurred by the previous permit holder are satisfied in full. And so I think where a bit of the confusion comes in here is the definition of that word um, establishment. Um, it's not defined in the regulations. Um, that can be interpreted a different way. I mean, I mean different ways. Um, I mean, if you were strictly saying it needs to be the same LLC um, that owns the business, I mean, that wouldn't necessarily make sense because you often have, you know, chances where, or, or uh, you know, in incidences where um, a different LLC will buy an existing business but use the same branding, continue in continuous operation, and so on. I think most people would consider that the same establishment. Um, and uh, in this case, um, this is a um, you know somebody who's going into the exact same spot, running the same type of business. They are changing the name. They do have a different LLC, but to the layman on the street, I mean, I think most would consider that the same establishment, um, at least possibly. To my mind, it's a bit open to interpretation. Um, and so, you know, what I thought having read through the regulations is that I do think the regulations are clear that if a, um, a uh, permit um, is not renewed within 30 days um, of expiring, the applicant has to go before the Board of Health to art to uh, you know, request that they have the opportunity to renew the license. And given this case, given those ambiguities and the fact that even if we did determine it was the same establishment, they would need to petition the Board of Health because no matter what, they would be renewing this permit more than 30 days after it expired, that um, I thought it would be best for them to go to the Board of Health and, and make their case as to, um, 
you know, why they should be given the opportunity to to renew that license, um, you know, if the board did feel that it would be reasonable to conclude it was the same establishment. Thank you. Maureen or Tim? I'm not clear um, when you say it's the same establishment. Steve, uh, looks like it is expired, but it also changed the ownership. I agree it, it is expired. Um, and I think um, that word establishment is ambiguous. I mean, we did have another uh, case where there was a um, tobacco licensee that um, did not close for any period of time. But that that business was bought by a different um, a different owner, and that owner had a different LLC, um, and they you know kept the same branding and everything. They continued on exactly the same business, and um, you know to my mind that's certainly the same establishment, um, even if the ownership is different. Um, this case is a little bit different. There was a uh, a closure, um, but I think that the definition of a you know establishment isn't really defined and you know in, in one sense of uh, looking at it you know there's a liquor store with the same liquor license in the same location some people would 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 consider that to be the same establishment i try to give the benefit of the doubt to any um any you know business people or anybody who comes before uh, me or the license commission um you know uh, regulations you know I, I work with drafting regulations for that and they can often be ambiguous and sometimes you know things things come up and i try to just give the the greatest um the greatest deference when those are are um ambiguously written and in this case i thought because you know certainly whether or not um you know the board would uh, consider this to be the same establishment or arguably so it certainly was not renewed um in time um and um i believe section uh, 5c10a says um in the latter half no existing permanent renewal will be denied based on the requirements of the subsection except any permit holder who has failed to renew his or her permit within 30 days of expiration will need to come before the Amherst Board of Health for a hearing to determine whether the lapsed tobacco product sales permit shall be renewed. So I think regardless of, of you know, this establishment question, I think that is certainly true when the app, the applicant here would need to come before you to, uh, you know, request that they be able to renew that since it, the license has been expired for more than 30 days. But I do think that question of what an establishment is um, is ambiguous. And um, that's that's part of the reason why I brought this up to Jen. Well, then we'd need a hearing. Certainly. Which would have to be publish, publicized. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts, Maureen? I don't know. What about section B under that uh, number 10? It does seem to say that if it hasn't been renewed, yeah. Because of the retailers no longer sells tobacco or because the retail closes, the retail business shall be returned to the Amherst Board of Health and permanently retired. Um, so I, I don't know how that, that doesn't seem that ambiguous to me, that part of it. Um, I did, I, uh, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. Um, no, I do see exactly where you're coming from, Maureen. And um, I did notice that. And um, I think, you know, what, what kind of made me pause with that is, is there certainly is a little bit of, bit of um, I don't want to say flexibility, but I mean, for example, during COVID, a lot of establishments were required to close and to yeah. not sell those kind of tobacco products. And I don't think that that would necessarily, you know, trigger these, um, trigger mm -hmm. these provisions. Um, you know, this establishment, I think, did go under in a large part because of the uh economic um impacts of that and mm -hmm. uh, you know i certainly didn't want to make the decision myself i wanted to present it to the board of health and i wanted to talk to jen and present it to the board of health and put it before you yeah but I understand. In my mind it was a bit too ambiguous of a situation for staff to decide on their own yeah i'm just going to all of our past hearings on our tobacco regulations the point was to continuously reduce the number of sites where tobacco products are sold in town And that says that clearly there. If you want to argue what we identify as an establishment, well, we can would have to consult with a lawyer, our lawyer. Well, I'd be very grateful if the board would do that uh, and, and get a reading on whether or not the regulations as as written, in fact, 
govern all adult only alcohol stores. No, I, I think we also need to get Cheryl Sabara and TJ Wilson to, to comment on this. They're, they're from the state and they helped us write these regulations. And I, I believe TJ Wilson still helps enforce the regulations. Cheryl Sabara now is the director of the Mass Association of uh, Boards of Health. Well, it sounds like <laughs> I may be leaving tonight without much guidance. That the case. Well, I, 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 I'm glad to, that the board would seek some clarification on this. We'll be keen to hear what they have to say. So shall we proceed by contacting, uh, Jen, I need some help here. Contacting Cheryl and TJ Wilson and then. <clears throat> yeah, I can do that. Um, and I don't know, and, going to our, our, our legal places, I, 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 know, I know how these regulations were, um, the intent of them when they were written. Um, and I feel like I'm being um, blindsided here a little bit. I knew this was coming up, but I, I didn't know it was going to start a, a, a legal battle type of thing. Um, but I think we really need legal clarification. So I can definitely contact them and see if our own town attorney can do that. I can do that, but I think when I present to them what the the issue is, I'm going to need help with with the wording. I don't want to summarize it myself, so I don't know how to do that. Well, um, I'll try calling Cheryl tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So we need more legal clarification. I know the intent of these regulations and what they were. And I know COVID and I know this, but the idea is to decrease the amount of tobacco sales in town. So Nancy, you said you're gonna contact Cheryl? I'll, I'll contact Cheryl okay. tomorrow. So we'll put this on to the May agenda. Yeah. And then we'll see if we need a hearing uh, in June and it'll have to be posted for a hearing in June. So May on the agenda. Oscar and Dick, is that okay? I mean, calendar wise, the May meeting, it's the second Thursday. So it'd be May 11th. And then we'll see what information we have and then it may proceed to a, a hearing. Well, yeah, that date's fine. I, I don't want to see this just drag out indefinitely, though. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I, 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 frankly, I don't think it's very ambiguous. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. Um, so we'll, I, I will take it that the board is taking no action today and uh, we'll consult with council and revisit this issue uh next month is that right yes and then if we need to then we'll hold a hearing in june okay thank you okay thank you okay. hey whoops Steve, thanks for coming. My pleasure. And I um, mm -hmm. I hope you all uh, enjoy the beautiful weather out there. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Take care. Okay. Next, we have a geothermal well at 3 Duxbury Lane, well 23C. Um, and Ed has sent us um, the permit pictures, the well drillers license, which is current. 
Um, yep, so Ed told me to tell you he's always available for more complicated wells. Um, and he felt this was um, a, a pretty um, general well and um, should be uh, no big issues for um, you to proceed without him. Okay, does anyone have any comments or questions on this permit and Ed's? support of the well? I don't seem pretty straightforward to me. I don't know, Tim. Tim? You see these, you have better eyes. <laughs> I think it's very straightforward. Um, we have approved this type of a simple, uh, simple well installations. Um, I don't see any problems. Uh, the only problem, this might be in the future is uh, there are more number of wells um, and the scale of the number of well installations like they're proposing in some schools. Those are the ones it's open for discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, can they have a motion to uh, approve this geothermal well? I'll move to approve the geothermal well or where is it, Duxbury? Three Duxbury. Three Duxbury. I second it. Okay, so we've had a motion, it's second. Um, any more discussion? Then we'll vote on it. Tim? Aye. Maureen? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. Okay, that was done. Director's update. Okay, thank you for the geothermal well. I'll let Ed know. <clears throat> so I have a, a few things and I'm gonna go um, just keep moving through them, hopefully kind of rapidly. Um, the first one is what Nancy um, commented on the beginning of the meeting that the remote meeting provision has been extended to March 31st, 2025. So we can stay Zoom. Some meetings in town, I understand may um, continue hybrid. But for the near future, we'll continue um, Zoom in the same fashion. Um, the second item is, as we know, the Massachusetts declared the public, the declared public health emergency is ending May 11th. And I'm trying to think about how that's going to affect uh, local boards of health. So I made a full a few bullets. Um, one thing is that we're going to be ending our case management of COVID cases. Um, our case case manager, contact tracer, Joseph Afoso will be ending his position. He's been with us since 2021. And many of us have spoken to him. You may have spoken to him. He's done thousands of cases for us. Um, but we're going to continue to monitor um, all our infectious diseases, including COVID. So we'll keep the case counts going uh, for the foreseeable future. But at some point, that will be changed. Um, we post it daily. We'll probably go to a different model at some point, either weekly or monthly. Um, but we'll continue our infectious disease um, case management and any um, high risk cases we always intervene on, um, intervene with. Um, we give people calls um, um, in our, our normal case contact kind of investigation and mm -hmm. then offer support to people. And then also to the public, anyone's available to contact the health department if they have any questions with COVID um, and um, infectiousness and timetables, we're always here to help people um, with any kind of problem solving. Um, another um, new vocabulary word for me, this is something from the States called redetermination. And it's just a notice um, notification for people that the Medicaid Mass Health um, that um, re-enrollment was extended through COVID, um, but now um, it turns out that extension will be ending. So many people will have to reapply um, for their mass health. And if you received a blue envelope in the mail, that means you need to reapply. So people are sort of out of the um, out of sync with doing that um, for three years. They haven't had to. So it's just a notice to the public to be wary that. If you have mass health, make sure that it's up to date. 
Um, DPH is going to provide COVID vaccine into the fall. So that's a, a word. I don't know when the adult vaccine will end, but we'll have it at the beginning of the fall. At some point, that will end for adults, um, but we'll be able to continue vaccine, COVID vaccine free for 18 and younger um, under the Vaccine for Children program. So we'll always have that. Um, if I find out more about when that free vaccine ends, I'll let people know. Um, and then there's some talk about a second bivalent booster. Um, still no word yet. Um, it's with the FDA. There's still advisory boards with the FDA. It has not gone to the CDC yet. They have two advisory boards. Then it goes to DPH and then we get the regulations. So there's some hoops to jump through. Um, nothing's come to us yet, but sometimes these things happen really fast. Um, so we may know soon. But for now, it's just that bivalent booster. If you've had that and they started in September, um, then you're up to date. When we do get the second bivalent booster, it'll probably be for 65 and older and moderately uh, immunocompromised. Any questions about that? Maureen, have you heard anything? No, I think I've read the same thing you did from the state. Um, yeah. yeah. And yeah, well, it, it's complicated, a lot of complicated things about little kids right now, <laughs> the, the uh, protocols, but but I think oh. for the fall, there there's, looks like there'll be a new bivalent vaccine, question when. Yeah, yep. Um, and it's, um, and then at some point, it'll probably take sort of the, the rhythm of flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. It'll be an annual. I think that's the prediction right now. Um, the other thing under um, vaccine I have is that we did the vaccine equity program through DPH. That was the family COVID clinics and the $75 incentives. Um, I did a, a Zoom meeting with a few people from DPH, maybe six people, and they really commended the town of Amherst. It was a meeting just for us, just for Amherst, and they really said thank you to us and our teamwork. Um, we held six clinics and about a thousand people were vaccinated with that program. And I think that were that was people that were sort of on the edge and that incentive really worked. And I think there's research that says in general, incentives don't work for vaccination, but if you team it with, um, with a, a good relationship and trust, you can really increase vaccination. So a thank you to everybody that was involved in that. And a special thank you to Crest. They were really by our side. And then they weren't by our side, they were doing it without us. They just were wonderful partners and helped a lot of people get vaccinated. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, now I'm moving on to another um, topic. Um, something I did two weeks ago is I took a tour of the wastewater treatment plant and it was wonderful. It's such great teamwork. The people that work there are so knowledgeable. We're really in good hands. But when I think about the wastewater treatment plant, Tim, have you been there? Yes. Yeah, it's impressive, isn't it? Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> I take my students there. Yeah. Oh, you do? <laughs> I just, I, I was sort of blown away, I have to say. But when I think about public health, so there are three things that came <laughs> to mind when I was touring, and, and Tim, you might have more, but I got to see where we did the COVID surveillance, not we, but the staff there, and um, where they take the three times a week um, sample, and it's quite a setup they have. It's not just dipping, you know, a, a, obviously a ladle into the effluent. It's a real, real um, structure they had to build where they get this sample. So it was really good to see that. And I encourage people um, to continue to look at our wastewater surveillance sampling and the numbers, which have been consistently on the low side. Um, and that's on our website. The second thing I saw was one of the pools um, where they skimmed the grease off. So the fog, the fats, oil, grease. So if it comes into the wastewater treatment plant and gets to this point, they skim it off and they put it in a bucket and it's the most solid grease I've ever seen. And on the skimmer, there were actually birds. It was almost like suet. It was really sort of dramatic, but it's getting skimmed off there, which is the it's not great, 
but it means that it's not going into the sewers um, and clogging up pipes. So we've talked about that before, how the fog that fat oils grease gets into the sewers. So people either flush it down the toilet or it gets down, put down the wastewater drainage and it gets mixed with dental floss, flushable wipes that shouldn't be flushed <laughs> and um, masks, you know, so anything then these cause um, sewer overflows. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing I saw, so this is getting my mind going, is I saw NIPS. So the three oh. effluents from North Amherst, UMass, and then South Amherst, um, they come in. And it's sort of this little back eddy where water's um, going in and sort of coming out. But that's where the NIPS um, go. And they have to be brought up by this big auger. Tim, is that a, a good description of that, those effluents? But what it means is that these nips are everywhere and they actually get flushed down the toilet. So I see them when I'm walking, the garbage is incredible. When I'm on my bike and a little higher, I actually see more nips by the, the mm -hmm. roadside. And um, thank you, Nancy Schroeder. Um, we are doing, just I just did like a little write up. They are not recyclable. So they're so small, they get mucked up into the recycling, they fall, um, below the recycling um, belts, I'm going to be saying that wrong, and they, they cannot be recycled. So that's something that's our community, our um, um, uh, transfer station brings our um, recycling down to uh, Springfield, the uh, material recycling facility, I think that's our, the MRF as to our neighboring towns. So they're not recycled anywhere in this area. So anyhow, I have nips on my mind. I just wanted everyone to know. Any comments about nips? No. Okay. Are there any ways of getting them out? I mean, it's regulating them or? Well, yeah, so are other- Are communities doing any? I know this is a big problem everywhere. What other, what might be a solution? Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for asking. I appreciate that. Chicopee. Um, so I have a white paper going. So it's like a little draft and I'm mm -hmm. jotting down things that come into mind. Chicopee's um, town council has proposed this. I don't think it's passed, but there's about seven communities that it has passed that you're not allowed to have the, the, you put the sale of 50 ml or 100 ml um, alcohol is prohibited in those towns. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it's sort of this in motion, it's becoming. Yeah, I agree. They are everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you're finding them on the road, I mean, you can guess that they're being consumed on the road and tossed up. Yeah. The so they're coming through the the sewer system, not the storm system? Storm drains and sewer. Wow. So, yeah, they I get never flushed. think of flushing something like that. No. Well, you don't want. You don't want to get caught. <laughs> yeah, you don't want somebody to see you drink. drink yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I'm going to move on. Um, national. <laughs> oh, in, so in, in my public health. In my diploma school, we went to the sewer treatment plant and the water treatment plant for part of our community public health. So I've been to them, but- Oh, I should have asked. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yes, yeah, it is. But way back in the late sixties, it was part of our public health course. Oh, that's mm -hmm. so progressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the it water was... treatment. Yeah. Both of them. I haven't been there. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. It's really fascinating. Um, so I'm going to move on. <clears throat> public health, um, National Public Health Week was the first week in April, and we're going to be celebrating it. We're joining forces with the Musanti Health Center, and we have a booth at the Sustainability Fair that's coming up April 22nd, and that's on the Commons. Thank you very much, Kyle O'Connor and Olivia Lara Cahoon. Um, who are going to be working there that day. So please come by the Sustainability Fair, Busanti Health Center, and the health department will be there. Um, and you can meet our staff and get some information about health in Amherst. Um, 
the public health nurse is be going to be starting office hours with Craig's doors. Um, she's working closely with them and that will be starting soon. A lot of work goes into that and everyone's very excited. And thank you again uh, to Maureen for helping vaccines for children um, and our immunization clinic. It's a real success. Um, and we look forward to, to continuing that program. Um, it's just serves such a, a, a purpose and it's really vital um, to get these kids um, that are under um, uh, 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 insured or no insurance right into school as they come into Amherst. So we'll continue that. And then our public health program assistant, um, shout out to Kyle, Kyle O'Connor. He's gonna be starting um, uh, 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 the community health improvement plan. That's Chip, he's gonna be taking all this good um, information that he and the team have um, uh, procured through the community health assessment. And we'll be starting looking at um, how to implement that. And Kyle will be, um, working with the Board of Health meetings. And Kyle, thank you so much. You're doing a great job already, I see it. And then another staff information piece of information, um, Nancy Schroeder is joining um, with the DEI, the Department of Equity Inclusion. He's a, she's a liaison uh, for the health department here. And she's joining as a, a part of the core equity team. And when I get more information on that, I'll let everyone know, but she's being trained to facilitate community events. Events. She'll, she'll still be part, um, with you. She's not. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I made that sound Good. a little. Too okay. Dramatic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing is that um, we um, have two board of health members leaving, and their vacancies um, for board of health positions. We've had some applicants, and thank you to them. We haven't started interviewing yet. Um, ideal candidate, I think we spoke about, has public health background and possibly civil or water engineering. I think that's what you said. I don't want to not quote you properly. Anyone interested in applying can go to the health department webpage, and there's a link to the community activity form, or you can do that on the town of Amherst uh, website. So thank you, everybody. Okay. Um, thank you. And any public comment, we're down to one attendee now. And Stephen, yes. Can we let Stephen in? He has his hand raised. Oh, he's been so patient. Yeah. Oops, he disappeared. Oh, no, he's no, there. He's yeah. There. He's just, oh. Uh, yeah. Oh, there he is. Okay. Yeah. Cannot start video because, okay. okay. All right, so it's just sound. Okay, my bad. Um, so I had a couple questions. So um, one, I heard you guys mention Corey checks. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I was wondering, one, what you guys would be looking for, and two, what would bar somebody from getting a license in the town? That's a good question. Um, You know, we do these all the time. Um, you know, I had to do that to go be a parent at a middle school book fair. Um, you know, I think it's looking for something serious. I don't think that, you know, minor issues with the law would preclude that, but I think it would just be something to consider. Okay. Yeah. And it's yeah. criminal something. Um, something record I, I can't remember what Corey stands for but um yeah there if you if you go to a school if you're teaching if you're a, a nurse if you're a doctor if you're if you're volunteering in certain settings, settings mm -hmm. yes um it's pretty routine um I think it would have to be something serious that would provoke other conversations um okay Okay. And also, so my other question would be, so like you guys uh, all seem to be in agreement that it would be okay to drop the high school diploma and the, um, uh, my question was, you guys kind of all have like different answers for how long the uh, guest artist permit could be for. 
um was there like kind of like a general consensus on how long it could be like like a month or, or so? i don't know if we talked about it that much but i like i think it came up to be a month then be renewable you know okay um I okay. don't know what your thought is. I know you said two weeks is very short. Right, um, right. So ideally, uh, so I've been thinking with like hiring people because some um, I've gone like across the country to work at friend shops mm -hmm. over the years. And one of the things that I like to do is like have people back like several times mm -hmm. um, or I would like to do um, ideally. And like possibly have it for like maybe a period of like three months. So it'd be like maybe like a quarter of the, the price of the license. Mm -hmm. You know, so that way, like at least it's like a good solid chunk. It kind of gives somebody like the opportunity to like be here and then like go back to their home shop and then come back for another like few weeks. That way, if I'm going to hire somebody, basically I could like really see who they are. Mm hmm. It would mean like a stretch of, of three months in a row, or maybe they'd come for three weeks and come again later um, for that period of time and repeatedly for like in the space of a year or something. Yeah, I, I think it would be more or less like they have the opportunity at that point to work for a full three months here or leave and come back. It just make more the opportunity to, to have that like quarter of the year for them to either work continuously or come back. Okay. Well, we can try to figure something out. And yeah. Look around. I know, I think this week kind of, as we off, as towns often do and boards often do look to other, other towns to see what they say. And I think this two weeks and <clears throat> gotten how many times that's what Northampton is regulations are and I think East Hampton has is quite the same as Northampton mm -hmm. um one thing I noticed Stephen is that we are the only person in Amherst like East Hampton and Northampton have a lot of body art people mm -hmm. do you un have an un sense of why that is is that have anything to do with the regulations in Amherst does it have anything to do with anything else that you know of um, so the answer is yes and no, all at the same time. Um, <laughs> so one, like I grew up here. Mm -hmm. So, um, being in a town that is basically like their life's blood is, is the students, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I've been tattooing for 19 years. So when there's no students here, I'm able to have like my own clientele that I've built up over the 19 years. So I don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. So like a town like Northampton has constant people that are like new to the town, like coming in and out. And like, basically like their downtown is built to have more walking traffic that isn't mm -hmm. just restaurants and bars. Mm -hmm. So like having different interests in the town attracts more people to it. So basically it, it makes for a, a better business um, diversity. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, also, I think um, when it comes to the body art regulations, um, one, like not having the guest artist availability to like bring new people to the town has definitely blocked. Um, like I had said before, um, <clears throat> the high school diploma has definitely like blocked me from having other artists come work here that mm -hmm. I've known for years. So it may have blocked other people from coming to work here in the past. The other big thing is, um, you guys talked about briefly like the the piercing mm -hmm. um and the regulations for amherst as far as piercing are very restrictive mm -hmm. um they are like stating like I'm, I'm, i apologize i i know there was like a certain amount of piercings that were allowed in the town mm -hmm. um and like they were piercings that were very popular probably 20 years ago or so when the regulations were made mm -hmm. but now the industry has gone a lot further mm -hmm. um i'm not a piercer nor have i ever in, endeavored into it myself mm -hmm. um we did have piercing here for a very short time but the problem was was that a lot of the stuff that people were asking for was not allowed in the town yeah. 
I as wonder as body modification. Yeah. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. I was, no, that's okay. I, un I interrupted you. Oh, okay. Um, I do have a friend that has been piercing, uh, since the mid nineties and he may be a good contact, mm -hmm. um, to talk to about piercing in today because it's, it's moved to also like different forms of body modification, which I believe are also not allowed in the town. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if I should like ask him if it's okay to contact him or whatnot. If you guys are ever interested, um, let me know and I could try to make that contact. Okay. But I think it would be great for the town because there are a lot of people that want to do that stuff and the students just uh, go to Northampton instead of coming to Amherst Center because it's not available. Mm -hmm. And my last question is, um, so we went over this stuff. Um, I'm wondering when I would hear what y'all's ruling is, like what you guys decided. As you might have noticed this reviewing <laughs> regulations is a bit of a slow process um, because okay. we meet monthly and it, you know we work on things in between and discuss and review. It's okay. going to be a couple months at least. Okay. What we do is we get our final draft and then there's a public hearing. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> and then we vote on them. All right. Yeah. Sorry about the process. It is a process. No, no, it's okay. Um, I'm just trying to uh, know what if I should be researching things or like bringing any other like topics up. Um, if you guys have any questions um, or I definitely like to be like contacted, like when like the next meeting that like this is going to be brought up at. That way I can uh, help guide you guys along or answer anything that you have questions about. Uh, I, can Stephen give me information during the month and I can pass along? Is that a good way to do it? That would be good. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. So it'll we'll come up on, on our May 11th meeting. Okay. Stephen, we, we've emailed, right? Uh, we have contact? not emailed, okay, but uh, I have your business card, which uh, brownj at amherstmass.gov. Yes. Okay. I will send you an email so you have my email address. Okay. And we can go from there. And All right. thanks for listening to me, everybody. Okay. Uh, I hope welcome. you have a great Thank weekend. you for your input. It's yes. helpful. Very helpful. Thank no you. problem. Thank you. Okay, so topics not anticipated by the chair. Um, I forwarded an email from Michelle Miller um, about the um, reparations questionnaire. She's asking um, uh, people to fill it out. Mm -hmm. um, you've got the information from Zero Waste, um, which is working its way. And I just want to reiterate uh, what um, Jen said about replacements, because uh, hopefully you'll be able to interview end of May, beginning of June, and have replacements for July. Because as today, you never know what's going to happen. And if there's only three people, and one person is sick or has an, a crisis, you won't have one. Uh, for a meeting um, and mm -hmm. if you need to so um so that's important um, get replacements on for july 1st and uh, any other comments for the good of the board thank you all for your work it's very valuable we're adjourning. Our next meeting is May 11th at 5 30. Okay. So, thank you and enjoy the beautiful weather. No, we have to like move the winter. Oh, yes, we have to move. <laughs> I don't know where my head is today. I think it's in the clouds well, um, from the weather. Um, also, with my allergies is all stepped up. So, we need a, a motion to close the meeting. I'll move to adjourn today's meeting. I second it. 
So it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Tim? Aye. Maureen? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. Thank you. Good night, Thanks, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Kyle. No problem. So after I hit end, it should just probably stop recording by itself or should I hit pause recording right now? You can hit pause recording. <laughs>